Welcome back to The Daily Poem here on the Close Reads Podcast Network. I'm David Kern. Today's poem is by Percy Shelley, a romantic poet, an English romantic poet who lived from 1792 to 1822. He is our... Uh, featured Poet of the Week, if you will. In fact, all week long, I'm reading the uh, five different parts of Ode to the West Wind, one for each day of the week. And today being Wednesday, that means that today it is time for part three of this uh, classic poem. So I'm going to dive right into it. Here is part three of Ode to the West Wind by Shelley. Thou who didst waken from his summer dreams the blue Mediterranean where he lay, Lulled by the coil of his crystalline streams, beside a pumice isle in Bayes Bay, and saw in sleep old palaces and towers quivering within the waves in tenser day, all overgrown with azure moss and flowers so sweet the sense faints picturing them. Thou for whose path the Atlantic's level powers cleave themselves into chasms, while far below the sea blooms and the oozy woods which wear the sapless foliage of the ocean know thy voice and suddenly grow gray with fear and tremble and despoil themselves. Oh, here. So in each of the uh, first two stanzas, we've been talking about the, the different kind of effect or influence that the wind, uh, the west wind in particular, has on nature. Uh, here we're getting, um, we're, we're getting water. What does the wind do to the water? What does it do to the sea? In some ways, this is my favorite part um, of the poem because the, the pacing of it tends to change. Even this very first stanza, we get a different, we get a sleepier a sleepier sense to this poem. So this whole poem is written in a in a consistent form. There's a consistent rhyme scheme uh, to it. In fact, it's written in a uh, loose terza rima. So there's an A B A B C B C D C D E D E E rhyme scheme for each of these parts. But here in part three, he changes the pacing on that, even though he's, he's sticking to the form. And, and there's a sleepierness to these first three lines, even the way it enjams summer dreams, the blue Mediterranean. Like you have to say that more slowly than some of the other more aggressive things that he has to say. And then there's a little uh, side note where he lay lulled by the coil of his crystalline streams, that, that bit of, um, of assonance there, lulled by the coil of his crystalline streams, slows you down as well. And so, you know, we get into this this idea of sleep and, and deep sleep ending, which is kind of an inversion of what we typically think about with winter. You know, underneath the ocean are old palaces and towers quivering within the waves in tenser day. So there were days when, when the the wind buried old cities under 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 the sea and there's this idea of the uh, bay eye and and apparently um i read this is a resort in southwest italy containing hot sulfur springs and the area has a history of volcanic activity which is where the reference to the pumice comes from and i and i was reading while re- researching this poem that that some people thought that the roman ruins are visible that not the roman ruins that the certain roman ruins are visible beneath the waters there uh, or maybe the poem's re- referring to Atlantis. There's, there's, a <laughs> there's some debate about that. So first we get the Mediterranean, but then the poet turns to the Atlantic. Thou for whose path the Atlantic's level powers cleave themselves into chasms. And so that, that brings things quite a bit closer to home, particularly in an age, you know, Shelley's age, when, when sailing was the key mode of transportation from certain, you know, there were no airplanes and, uh, you know, horses and wagons only get you so far and not very far when it comes to, a, to an ocean. So the wind at work on an ocean is, uh, is a potentially deadly thing, which is why we then get the reintroduction of the theme of fear, I think, at the end of this poem. The sea blooms, the sapless foliage, they know the wind's voice and they grow gray with fear and tremble and despoil themselves. And then once again at the end, he pleads. So he reintroduces the concept of fear. And then once again, as in the first two stanzas, he pleads with the west wind. 
Now, what is he pleading exactly about? I mean, he hasn't totally told us yet. Uh, we'll have to see what happens in four and five on Thursday and Friday. But once more, here is part three of Ode to the West Wind as we make our way through this classic poem. Thou who didst waken from his summer dreams the blue Mediterranean, where he lay, lulled by the coil of his crystalline streams, beside a pumice isle in Bayeye's Bay, and saw in sleep old palaces and towers quivering within the waves in tenser day. All overgrown with azure moss and flowers so sweet, the sense faints picturing them. Thou, for whose path the Atlantic's level powers cleave themselves into chasms, while far below the sea blooms and the oozy woods which wear the sapless foliage of the ocean, know thy voice, and suddenly grow gray with fear, and tremble, and despoil themselves. Oh, hear. This has been The Daily Poem. Thanks so much for listening. Be back tomorrow as we move into part four of this poem. <laughs>